evening, everyone. Goeien aand aan allemaal en mooi It's it's cold and wet here in Stellenbosch, but we are not complaining because we are very grateful for the first proper winter rains. And um, I'm sure that now that we are all in the same room, that um, the atmosphere in this room will at least be warm and invigorating. And uh, let's hope that we don't have any further technical problems, uh, whether by means of the platform or ESCOM. Uh, please allow me just to give a special uh, word of welcome to some participants tonight. First of all, our esteemed speaker, Judge Navi Pele. Uh, we had invited Judge Pele in uh, 2020, but due to the turmoil brought about by COVID-19, um, last year's annual lecture for the first time ever had to be postponed. And um, our last speaker, our previous speaker, um, who delivered a very insightful lecture in 2019, was our previous, our then Auditor General of South Africa, Mr. Timbiki Lekimi Makwetu, uh, who of course have since uh, has very sadly passed away. Um, so Judge Pele, thank you so much for being available again this year. And um, despite all of these challenges, we've made it. We, we yeah, and we are looking forward. Uh, to listen to you tonight. Um, welcome here. Then I would also like to welcome the members of our Stellenbosch University Rectorate and in particular our Chancellor, uh, Justice Edwin Cameron. Welcome to you. I would also like to welcome former and current members of the Judiciary, um, including Justice Richard Goldstone, I would like to uh, specifically mention members of the Executive and Parliament and also participants from the Chapter 9 institutions. Um, and there in particular, perhaps I can mention the Chair of the South African Human Rights Commission, Advocate Bungani Mayola. Delegates from our sponsor, Weber Wenzel, academics from other universities, law firms, community organizations, members of civil society, the media, and last, but certainly not least, our colleagues, our students, and alumni. It is indeed a great honor for me to welcome you also on behalf of Professor Sandra Liebenberg, HF Oppenheimer Chair in Human Rights at Stellenbosch University, in this our centenary as a law faculty to the 15th Annual Human Rights uh, Lecture. From the very start, this lecture has been hosted with the support of Weber Wenzel, and we are very grateful and proud of this alliance. This public lecture is a flagship event in our annual calendar, not only because of the prestigious speakers that we have been fortunate to collaborate with over a decade and a half, um, and this list is truly impressive, including nine uh, constitutional court justices, a well-known public protector, judges from the Supreme Court of Appeal, an esteemed member from the Cape Bar, and a highly regarded international academic. But other than the opportunity to listen to, to, listen, uh, to these very esteemed speakers, this is a flagship event also because our faculty recognize the importance of human rights in the pursuit of a socially just, a free, and a democratic society. Universities have a very important and unique role to play and to fulfill in this quest. And as a faculty, we are committed to playing our part. There's just a few housekeeping arrangements that I've been tasked with sharing with the room. Um, I think the important thing is that since we have moved from the live event platform, we won't, won't have a Q&A session, but you will have the opportunity to pose questions in the chat box. What we will do is that uh, Professor Liebenberg, assisted with, uh, by her doctoral student, will collect these questions and will pose the questions to Judge Pillay at the end of the lecture, time allowing. Um, please note that we request that we always be respectful when commenting or posing a question. Please take note also that we will be recording the session and it will be posted on the Law Faculty's YouTube a channel and on other social media platforms in the coming week. So on that note, Professor Liebenberg will introduce our main speaker, 
but it is now my pleasure to welcome and introduce Christu Els. And you see Christu and uh, Judge Pele on the screen in front of you. Christu is a senior partner, or the senior partner of Weber Wenzel, and it's his second such term, if I understand correctly, and he's a partner in their corporate practice division. In the past, uh, he has achieved many professional milestones and accolades, and he's been named and nominated um, as joint dealmaker of the year, leading lawyer, who's who legal, uh, best lawyers, and I can continue in that vein on numerous occasions. He graduated cum laude with the BLC and LLB degrees from Pretoria University. And may I add that we were classmates, and therefore I'm especially happy and pleased for us to work now in this partnership, uh, Christian. He also holds a uh, master's degree in tax law, he has studied um, at Harvard Business School. Um, he uh, started at Weber Wenzel, and I hope that this will be an inspiring um, life journey also for our students present tonight. He started out at Weber Wenzel as a candidate attorney. Um, and I won't give away your age, Christy, let's just say 20 odd years ago. Um, and then tonight I invite you to address us as, as a senior partner of a, of a, of a large law firm. Um, what an inspiring, inspiring journey for your, for your um, purposes, but I think just as important, I also invite you as a like-minded and a, a well-respected collaborator and friend. So I hand over to you on that note, Christoph. Welcome and thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Nicola, and, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, as you heard, my name is Christo Els. I'm the senior partner at WebEvensal. On behalf of our firm who are sponsoring the event, I'm delighted to welcome you to this 15th annual Human Rights Lecture in the centenary year of the Stellenbosch Law Faculty. Weber Wenzel is just a little bit older than, than you are. Uh, we've been around for 153 years this year, and uh, as Nicola alluded to, for the last 25 of, of those, I've been privileged to, to work at Weber Wenzel, uh, an African law firm that has won numerous accolades for its specialist services. That really reflects our emphasis on employing the best people, enjoying what we do, and keeping our clients at the heart of everything we do. Many of our current partners are, and I, and I hope that many future of our partners will be, alumni of the University of Stellenbosch. At the moment, for those students that are online, we are taking applications for our 2023 Canada Attorney Program. The closing date for that is 31 May, so you've just got 10 days left, so please uh, if you are interested, uh, please do apply, and it's available online. We are honoured this evening to have Judge Navi Pile with us to address us on the topic of South Africa's engagement with international human rights law. It is a topic that resounds very clearly with our firm. We passionately believe that the Bill of Rights preserved in our Constitution is the cornerstone of our constitutional democracy. It enshrines the rights of all people in our country and affirms the democratic values of dignity, equality, and freedom. In the last year, we spent over 21,000 hours, uh, roughly an equivalent of 63 million rand on pro bono work, and a great deal of that work was centered on human rights. Our clients in this area include individuals, communities, and not-for-profit organizations. Over the years, we've assisted clients on several landmark matters in preserving the rule of law, upholding human rights and promoting social justice. I thought this would be an opportunity just to highlight a couple of those matters to you. The first one to mention is one that we actually worked on with the University of Stellenbosch's Legal Aid Clinic. So I think it will have a special significance for you this evening. We acted with the Legal Aid Clinic and 15 low-income workers in challenging emoluments attachment orders against wages for outstanding debt, some with interest rates of up to 60% per annum. In short, creditors were abusing the system and, and the mechanism because the applicable legislation was very vague. Although the collection mechanism still remains available to credit providers, as a result of the challenge, emoluments <coughs> attachment orders can no longer be issued by clerks of the court, but must now be granted by magistrates, requiring judicial oversight from those magistrates who consider what is just and equitable before an order is granted and whether the amount is appropriate. The matter ensured that the rights of the credit providers and debtors are balanced in a manner that is fair and equitable for all parties. 
unbelievably when you leak the facts, this matter ran for a very long time and in the end was a very important and landmark victory for the poor. Other long-standing matters that we're really proud to have worked on include assisting families of victims killed at the hands of security police during the apartheid era. Their deaths were often incorrectly recorded as suicides and we successfully reopened inquests into their deaths uh, and to help their families obtain some closure and justice. These include the deaths of Neil Agat and Ahmed Timor. Some of our recent pro bono work has now shifted to fighting COVID-19. During last year, our firm assisted business leadership South Africa, as well as the government on a pro bono basis in respect of various legal issues related to the pandemic and our fight against it. This included work to kickstart the National Ventilator Project to build some 20,000 ventilators and we are currently assisting our own as well as other governments in Africa with some legal issues related to the vaccine procurement. What these matters show is that terrible injustices can prevail, in particular in unequal societies. It also highlights the importance of both a constitution and a Bill of Rights. They demonstrate the importance of individual and collective responsibility for upholding both the law and human rights. And these are critical matters for many of our young aspiring lawyers that may be online tonight, both in South Africa, but also ultimately across the world. So I have no doubt that tonight's lecture will give us a deeper understanding of human rights, in particular in respect of South Africa's engagement with international human rights law. And I look forward to listening to Judge Pillay speak on this very topic this evening. Thank you very much, Christy, for those words and also for the, the summary of the very important work. Uh, we know that there are many other such cases that are being undertaken at the moment. I see that um, some of our um, DBCs are still joining and uh, we also want to welcome Prof. Teresh and others that I see um, in the room now. But Sandy, I'm going to hand over to you to formally introduce our keynote speaker tonight. Um, so, good evening everyone. Um, it gives me great pleasure to um, introduce you to Judge Navi Pele. Judge Pele grew up in KwaZulu-Natal, then the Natal province, during the apartheid period. In the 1960s, she was a student at the University of Natal, graduating with a BALB degree. During this period, she was active in various student organizations resisting the racial oppression and injustices of the apartheid regime. After earning her law degree, she became the first black woman to open her own law practice in the Natal province at that time. As an attorney, she was involved in defending anti-apartheid activists and exposing the use of torture and the deplorable treatment of prisoners. In 1982, she graduated with an LLM, followed in 1988 by a doctorate in juridical science from Harvard Law School. In 1995, she was appointed an acting judge on the High Court in KwaZulu-Natal, the first black woman to serve on the bench in KZN. But her tenure there was to be brief. That same year, she was elected by the United Nations General Assembly to serve as a judge at the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, set up to adjudicate international crimes in the aftermath of the terrible Rwandan genocide of 1994. She held this post for eight years, including for the last four years as president of the Rwandan Tribunal. In this role, she famously made great strides in the legal doctrinal issues pertaining to rape and sexual assault as war crimes and, and part of the definition of genocide. In 2003, she was elected by the UN as a judge 
on the International Criminal Court in The Hague, a post she held until 2008 when she was confirmed by the UN General Assembly as its High Commissioner for Human Rights. She served as High Commissioner from 2008 to 2014, and during her tenure she distinguished herself principally in relation to her courageous defense of human rights, particularly in relation to groups um, suffering or experiencing systemic discrimination, such as women, migrants, indigenous peoples, peoples living with disabilities, and LGBTIQ plus people. Moreover, she was known to champion a holistic vision of human rights at the UN, incorporating both civil and political rights as well as economic, social and cultural rights and the right to development. She is also famous for the institutional reforms she pioneered at the UN, particularly with a view to strengthening the overall system of human rights protection. Retirement has not slowed down Judge Pillay. Some of the initiatives in which she has been involved subsequent to her retirement include being appointed to the high-level panel on the assessment of post-apartheid legislation, chaired by former President Kahlema Motlanke, and serving as a member of the Special Reference Group on Migration and Community Integration in KZN. She is also a member of the African Group for Justice and Accountability and the African International Criminal Court Advisory Group. And just recently, last year, she was appointed an ad hoc judge on the International Court of Justice in the application brought by the Gambia against Myanmar, alleging violations of the Genocide Convention against its Rohingya population. She is also president of the International Commission Against the Death Penalty based in Madrid and president of the Advisory Council of the Nuremberg Principles Academy, which supports the fight against impunity for international crimes such as genocide, war crimes and crimes against humanity. Judge Pele, Navi, if I may, we are delighted to have such a distinguished guest as you to deliver this 15th Annual Human Rights Lecture to mark our faculty's centenary year. You have the floor, Judge Pele, to address us on the topic of South Africa's engagement with international human rights law. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy, for that kind invitation. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm really honored to deliver the 15th Annual Human Rights Lecture in celebration of the centenary of the Law Faculty, University of Stellenbosch. Um, I hope that you can all hear me because, unfortunately, uh, Sandy's delivery came out very fractured on my computer. I'd like to thank Professor Sandra Liebenberg and Professor Nicholas Smith for inviting me. Now, it was in January 19, 1995 that I assumed my post outside the country as a judge in the United Nations International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda in Arusha, Tanzania. When I, was, when I arrived there, I was seen as the face of democratic South Africa. I'm sure that that was also the experience of many other South Africans who were posted outside of our borders. The children on the dusty streets of Arusha 
would run after me and call out Mandela or Bafana Bafana. And I imagine they are dancing joyously to Jerusalem today. The struggle for freedom and fundamental rights in South Africa was won with the collective worldwide support of the international community and civil society organizations, human rights defenders, and ordinary people who, as children, stopped eating South African oranges in support of UN sanctions against the apartheid regime. Over the years, I have received many gratuitous compliments on our country's achievements, our peaceful revolution, exemplary constitution and bill of rights, and our trusted leaders. Judges and lawyers share their enthusiastic approval for our progressive laws and the influential decisions of the Constitutional Court, including on economic and social rights, the abolishment of capital punishment, giving prison inmates the right to vote, and opening up the production of generic antiretroviral drugs for HIV aid relief, despite opposition by patent monopolies. AIDS activists told me that the UN World AIDS Conference hosted by South Africa was saved by two heroes, Justice Edwin Cameron, the incumbent, incumbent chancellor of this university, and Professor Dr. Jerry Kuvadia. Because of this rich recent past, as well as the reception and perception of post-apartheid South Africa by human rights advocates, people likewise regularly tell me of their hope and expectation that South Africa will exercise its moral authority and take the lead on our continent and in the rest of the world for protection of human rights. So in this lecture, I will examine whether we have acted consistently and vigorously to deliver on the Mandela promise, namely, his insistence that human rights will be the light that guides our foreign affairs. This is, to be sure, a story that predates Mandela, and one cannot begin to understand where South Africa is today only on the basis of where it started in 1994. We must recall that much is needed to be overcome and changed in our country. South Africa's foreign policy objectives have included a focus on human rights, peace and security, and economic development. South Africa was a founding member of the United Nations in 1945, with apartheid leader Jan Smuts helping to craft the UN Charter's preamble, including its reference to human rights. It is remarkable to think that leaders and states actively violating human rights were among those expressing their importance. Of course, as commitment to human rights grew internationally and the horrors of apartheid became more widely understood, South Africa was suspended by the General Assembly for its apartheid policies in 1974 and, and was only readmitted in 1994 after the country had dismantled apartheid. Its history of expulsion and readmission into the United Nations membership has built and reinforced expectation that South Africa would and should hold a principled view and position on human rights on the international scene and in Africa in particular. The new South Africa was in this sense born in a human rights moment. Human rights and democratic principles became founding principles of our constitution, a document that has since become the envy and blueprint of many states emerging from autocracy into the promise of a democratic and human rights abiding future. We likewise situated our country not on an island unto itself, but as a member of a community of states aspiring to make respect for human rights a global norm. The preamble to our constitution is specific that our place is within, I quote, the family of nations. That means we never claim South Africa first, like Donald Trump's America first. Our country can't go it alone. Divided as they say, we will fall. We must thus instead follow the path 
of multilateralism. Our constitution further enjoins respect for international law. So, these are all the words. Let me now turn to the action and to South Africa's record on turning the rhetoric of its human rights into reality. So first on peace and security, South Africa's external record on human rights protection. South Africa has played and continues to play an important role within the multilateral system, taking up leadership roles in UN bodies and in the African Union while supporting and contributing towards the peace and security structures in both of these institutions. I will cover each in turn. The African Union, South Africa champions African priorities and contributes to the African Union and the Pan-African Agenda on Peace and Development. President Cyril Ramaphosa, as you know, served as the chair of the AU until February this year and he pressed for the urgent and equal distribution of COVID-19 vaccines to COVAX countries. He condemned the ugly trends of nationalism, greed and hoarding by rich countries of COVID-19 treatment drugs to the detriment of poor countries in Africa in particular. As a member of the AU's Peace and Security Council, South Africa is deeply engaged in conflict prevention, resolution of conflict and addressing accountability for serious human rights abuses in the context of the many violent conflicts in Africa. I recall that when I was High Commissioner for Human Rights, South Africa requested the help of human rights advisors from my office to work with them in advancing reconstruction efforts in Madagascar after a conflict there. South Africa likewise also played a significant role in the UN peacekeeping mission in Darfur, Sudan, before withdrawing after 12 years of service in 2016. In December 2020, South Africa's ambassador to the UN, Jerry Matthews Machila, told a press briefing that an AU-led mediating team had met with President Abiy Ahmed Ali of Ethiopia in the context of the ongoing fighting in Tigray and the ensuing humanitarian crisis. The efforts showed South Africa's commitment to conflict resolution, but sadly, Majila also noted that President Abiy Ahmed had rebuffed its offer to help negotiate the crisis. However, I do admire what South Africa is doing in the Democratic Republic of Congo, a region that remains volatile and dangerous for civilians with no end in sight, and with all of us saying, do something and do something. South Africa, together with Uganda, did do something. It promoted the idea of a Force Intervention Unit, FIB, which is a, a, a small, rapidly moving battalion that could move fast in, in those jungles. So this idea of a FIB was adopted by the Security Council and it's embedded in Security Council mission, UN mission in DRC. And why is it significant? Because it is the first time in the history of UN peacekeeping that a unit is authorized to carry out targeted offensive operations to disarm rebel groups. In other words, the UN for the very first time moved from simple peacekeeping to peace enforcement. Now you need to know that South Africa is the troop contributing nation in UN peacekeeping missions thus ensuring the safety and protection of civilian lives. But rich countries rarely contribute peacekeepers, and so the burden falls on developing countries. On a visit to conflict areas in Eastern DRC, I personally met and engaged with our brave soldiers in confrontation with heavily armed rebels in jungle terrain and facing hazards at great personal risk. South Africa's crucial contribution to saving civilian lives in conflict in Africa cannot be underestimated. But 
It must also be acknowledged that accusations have been made against our troops for acts of sexual abuse of children and girls in the countries where they are stationed. These remain uninvestigated, as do alleged crimes committed by peacekeepers more generally. Such complaints must be investigated and suspects prosecuted in an appropriate forum, as opposed to being ignored or actively swept under the rug by troop contributing states who claim jurisdiction over the actions of their troops, but do very little to investigate their alleged crimes. There is something particularly harrowing about soldiers being sent to protect vulnerable peoples only to become their predators. So I do believe that South Africa could provide leadership in addressing this pressing issue, perhaps by encouraging the creation of an international body with jurisdiction to investigate the authorities committed by UN peacekeepers. Likewise, human rights education must be included in the training program of soldiers deployed in peacekeeping missions, and more women should also be included in the ranks of peacekeeping duties. Let me look at the UN Security Council and our role there. South Africa served as a non-permanent member of the Security Council in the years 2007 to 8, 2011 to 12, and 2019 to 2020. In the context of the paralyzing divisions and fixed geopolitical positions adopted by the veto-wielding countries, that's US, UK, France, Russia, and China, colloquially referred to as the P5, South Africa has joined calls made to the P5 not to use their vetoes when evidence of atrocities are reported. And we can see this playing out right now with the uh, attacks on Gaza and, and the conflict between Israel and, uh, and, and Hamas that has not been resolved in Security Council meetings just two days ago. To meet the deadlocks, caused by the fractured relationship between the P2, Russia and China, and the P3, US, UK and France, South Africa formed alliances with elected African and Caribbean members of the Security Council, termed the A3 plus 1. However, African countries tend to have limited influence on matters affecting their continent. This was evident in June 2019 after the fall of Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir in April 2019. The A3 and South Africa pushed for a Security Council statement stressing the need for a transition to civilian rule in Sudan. The A3 supported the principle of, I quote, the primacy of African-led initiatives in search of a lasting solution of the crisis in Sudan without external interference. A good statement. But they were blocked by Russia and China, who had close military ties to the government of Sudan. And, so, and the Russian objection was that such a statement interfered in Sudan's internal affairs. South Africa's alliance with the A3 is reportedly guided by what's best for the continent. So clearly what is not best, what is not in the best interest of our continent is the failure of South Africa to acknowledge the coronavirus pandemic as a major threat to peace and security in and of itself. An initiative by Estonia for a statement from the Security Council that the coronavirus virus constituted a threat to international peace and security and calling for greater international cooperation in confronting the pandemic was opposed and overruled by China, joined by South Africa. They argued that the pandemic did not constitute a threat to international peace and security and was therefore not the business of the Security Council despite its effects on virtually every live political issue facing the globe today. They maintained their narrow-minded position in spite of support for an earlier 2014 Security Council resolution 
that had declared Ebola a threat to international peace and security, and that had urged the world to send more health care workers and supplies to the hardest hit countries, namely Liberia, Sierra Leone and Guinea. So in siding with China in this instance, South Africa lost the opportunity to serve the interests of Africa and poor countries by engaging the Security Council's STEM for international cooperation and action, while furthering the democratiz democratization of the international response and recovery from the pandemic. Her w a word now about the conduct, uh, pandemic COVID-19 vaccine. It's commendable that South Africa, together with India, took the lead and has sponsored a proposal at the World Trade Organization to temporarily waive intellectual property rights related to COVID-19 vaccines and treatments so as to allow for generic manufacturing around the world, warning that at the current pace of vaccinations, most poor nations will be left waiting until at least 2024 to achieve mass COVID-19 immunization. A waiver of the rules would help boost global supplies of vaccines for the poorest countries, and the proposal is for the waiver as well to be accompanied by the open sharing of vaccine knowledge and technology and by coordinated global investment in research development and manufacturing capacity underscoring that threats to public health are global and global cooperation is vital. Now the USA under the Trump administration used their Defense Force Act to boost their own vaccine production, as a consequence of which exports of, criti of critical raw materials were stopped. This is hindering and delaying vaccine production in other parts of the world. However, in a welcome uh, response in May, that's this month, President Biden made the decision to issue IP waivers for COVID-19 waivers. Let me look at UN bodies in general now. South Africa's record of interventions for the protection of human rights within UN bodies is inconsistent and often at odds with our constitutional principles of human rights and justice for victims. South Africa has, re has resorted to avoidance tactics such as, say, non-interference in the internal, in internal matters of state or claiming that to promote human rights would risk, I quote, creating dangerous precedents. They have relied on this approach to refrain from supporting human rights protection measures in the context of conflicts, even when credible evidence of massive violations of international human rights law and international humanitarian law are produced by UN agencies and civil society organizations. Really, it was so painful for me as High Commissioner to watch South Africa's failure to react to the extensive investiga investigations and reports from my office of massive civilian killing, sexual violence, and forced displacement during armed conflict in countries like Syria, Iraq, Sudan, and Sri Lanka. Many, many people in the international community who had collaborated in the anti-apartheid struggle have expressed their bewilderment. How would South Africans, South Africans have felt if we had sat back and said apartheid is an internal matter and we should not interfere? This is what they ask. Now, as we know, and as I have mentioned already, the struggle against apartheid was bolstered and its end precipitated in part because states made the internal problems of South Africa their human rights concern. They stood in solidarity with those seeking justice and dignity here. Hence, it bewilders and hurts many that less than three decades later, South Africa does not do the same for those facing chemical weapons attacks in Syria, genocide in Sudan, or ethnic cleansing elsewhere. 
During South Africa's first tenure as a non-permanent member of the Security Council, that's in 2007-2008, it did not support resolutions condemning human rights abuses in Zimbabwe and Myanmar and the inclusion of climate change in the agenda of the Security Council. And the rationale given for such positions at the time was the need to respect the division of roles among the various organs of the UN. In 2007, South Africa opposed a draft resolution condemning the killing of peaceful demonstrators by the military junta in Myanmar, arguing that condemning the junta's violence, I quote, does not fit with the UN Charter mandate because of its focus on internal affairs. And South Africa claimed that this was a fundamental reason for voting the resolution down and that its stance at the Security Council proved it had been, quote, true to itself. Now, on the contrary, their reaction is reminiscent of the opposition from the apartheid government in 1960, when Myanmar, then Burma, moved for a Security Council condemnation of the Sharpeville massacre. The apartheid government on that occasion had said that the discussion of the Sharpeville massacre would be, I quote, a most dangerous precedent. Yet, in my view, the real dangerous and troubling precedent is a post-Mandela government offering the same excuse as did the apartheid regime to avoid condemning human rights abuses. In July 2012, South Africa also opposed a Security Council resolution for action to protect victims of massive atrocities in Syria, siding with Russia, China and Pakistan and giving as their reason that the draft was, I quote, unbalanced. Few, if any, places have experienced worse violence and displacement than Syria has over the past decade. And so it's difficult to see how any condemnation of the blatant atrocities committed there could be unbalanced. So all of this seems to be symptomatic of a deeper suspicion among South African governments about the place of human rights at the UN. My, my predecessor as UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Justice Louise Arbour, was blocked from addressing the Security Council on Human Rights Abuses, mainly by South Africa, on the premise that human rights were not relevant to the peace and security mandate of the Security Council. Human rights, they insisted, should be raised at the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva. This surely stretches the imagination and is out of touch with reality. How can the Security Council exclude consideration of human rights abuses in conflict situations that are often alerts to such conflicts brewing in delivering on its mandate of peace and security? It can't. Human rights cannot be isolated from matters of international peace and security. And indeed, the Council has itself repeatedly touched on issues of human rights as integral to its work and as an important part of its reasoning and decision-making in response to political violence and war. In August 2008, upon my election as UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, South African Ambassador Dumisani Kumalo called me and told me that Poland was hosting a retreat for incoming members of the Security Council and wished to invite me to address the Security Council retreat. And Ambassador Kumalo encouraged me to accept. And this was the entry point I had been hoping for. During my six years as UN High Commissioner for Human Rights from 2008, to 2014, the Security Council paid increasing attention to human rights and invited me to address the Council more times than all the previous High Commissioners put together. I reported on human rights situations in Syria, Libya, Mali, Central African Republic, the occupied Palestinian territories, South Sudan and Ukraine. I addressed the Security Council as well on prevention of conflict and made clear to states 
that lack of responsiveness on the part of the council had led to the loss of thousands of lives, massive displacement and enormous suffering. I have urged the Security Council on a number of occasions to refer situations where war crimes and crimes against humanity are suspected to have been committed to the International Criminal Court. Regrettably, the international community remains unable to act strongly and, and quickly to crises, including situations of grave human rights violations with high potential for regional overspill. And unfortunately, the space that was open to brief the Security Council on human rights violations in countries on the Security Council agenda appears to have been closed. My successor, High Commissioner for Human Rights, Zaid Raad al Hussein, complained bitterly about being blocked from addressing the Security Council. South Africa must play a role in increasing the authority of the Security Council in the field of human rights and curtailing the use of the veto in situations of mass human rights violations. The P P5, the veto-wielding veto states, have done as little in responding to the world health pandemic as they have done in resolving the many conflicts raging in the world. When most needed, international action is often missing. And we can see this right now in the Israel-Palestinian situations. Of course, the Security Council holds informal consultations in closed meetings, but with no meaningful outcomes. The Security Council must be willing and able to act promptly and collectively as the UN Charter directs in order to address threats as they emerge, to resolve conflicts, and to prevent and punish violations of international humanitarian law and international human rights law. The pandemic makes clear that more than ever, multilateralism and not unilateralism is the answer for combating the pan pandemic and for achieving peace and security. We need to act globally to stem the rising tide of illib illiberal trends of nationalism, of populism and authoritarian authoritarianism that threaten our fundamental freedoms and that collectively frustrate progress on providing human rights protections to those without. We need to act in solidarity to safeguard the planet against climate change, against threats to peace, and to ensure protection and promotion of the human rights of all persons leaving no one behind. Let me now briefly look at South Africa's human rights engagement with the Human Rights Council and the UN mechanism. Our engagement with the current constellation of international human rights institution and institutions has been diverse, positive in some instances and questionable in others. So I'll give you a few examples. South Africa has ratified all the major UN human rights treaties as well as the optional protocol, but has not ratified the optional protocol to the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Crucial Rights. And we, and we all agree and know that economic rights and social rights are crucial for our country at this time. In 2001, South Africa hosted the first UN World Conference against racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia and related violence, which led to the landmark Plan of Action that sets a principled international agenda for the global movement against racism and xenophobia. The implementation of the Action Plan remains of crucial importance in our country as well as in the world as racial violence and xenophobia are on the rise, leading to protests such as the Black Lives Matter movement. South Africa should take the lead in implement, implementation of its action plan. In June 2011, the Human Rights Council adopted a resolution that was sponsored by South Africa. That was the first UN resolution on sexual orientation and gender identity, which expressed grave concern 
at violence and discrimination against individuals based on their sexual orientation and gender identity. The right to sexual orientation is a right under our constitution and so South Africa's support is in line with our constitutional values. This is the good part. But there is a dark side to South Africa's engagement on this issue. In June 2016, constitutional principles appear to have fallen by the wayside when South Africa abstained from a resolution adopted by the Human Rights Council regarding the appointment of an independent expert on protection against violence and discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. South Africa gave as their reason for the vote how, and I quote, how the current sponsors have sought to build on the South African initiative of 2011 has added divisive dimensions and created unnecessary, unnecessary acrimony in the council. Maximum consensus could have been achieved had it not been for the arrogant and confrontational approach adopted. So, of course, the, the resolution was adopted by a vote of 23 in favor, 18 against, and six abstentions, including South Africa. Other unfortunate developments followed. For example, at the June 2014 session of the Human Rights Council, a resolution on the protection of the family was adopted that did not recognize the various and diverse forms of family. South Africa voted in favor of the resolution and also backed Russia's attempts to shut down discussion of more inclusive language on the family that would have recognized single parent households, child headed households, same sex relationships, couples without children and other familial constellations in line with the jurisprudence established by our courts. At the September 2014 session of the Human Rights Council, South Africa unfortunately voted in favor of three amendments to the resolution on the death penalty moved by Saudi Arabia and China that would have deleted language relating to the human rights of those facing the death penalty and, and, would have, and where they wanted language inserted affirming the sovereign right of all countries to develop their own legal system and penalties. Now, the uh, proposed amendments that South Africa supported were all rejected and the original draft was uh, adopted. To me, South Africa was on the wrong side of human rights protection for them. And let me draw your attention to this practice more and more emerging where previously adopted resolutions are being interfered with by certain countries who want to add that sovereignty clause. It's typically resorted to by states with an agenda for an opt-out clause. So that's why it is very disappointing to support amendments such as that. At the March 2014 session of the Human Rights Council, South Africa sought to weaken a resolution on the right to free protest in line with Russia, Ethiopia, Saudi Arabia, Egypt and China. South Africa took negative stances on other rights issues too. It abstained from voting in all country situations, including on North Korea. Seem to have lost my... Including North Korea, Syria, uh, Sri Lanka and, and others. Just looking for the rest of my papers. Sorry about that. The other countries included Sri Lanka and Iran. And South Africa justified its actions by arguing that it does not support work on country-specific situations because they are highly politicized and divisive. This is despite the fact that country-specific resolutions play a key role in shedding light on abuses and giving a stronger voice to victims. They also allow for the creation of independent UN mechanisms that help expose abuse and pressure rights violators. In July 2016, the Human Rights Council adopted a resolution on the protection of human rights defenders working to promote economic, social and cultural rights 
by a vote of 33 member states of the Human Rights Council to just six against and eight abstentions. Yet South Africa voted against the resolution, explaining inter alia that it objected to the generalization that there is a clampdown on civil society in many countries. It also asserted that in South Africa there is no clampdown of civil society. And they also objected to new obligations as seen by them uh, for, for greater support to civil society organizations. You know, before I retired as High Commissioner, I had prioritized the need for greater democratic space for civil society organizations in the office's next four-year plan of action. And this was actioned by my successor, High Commissioner Zaid, in his report to the Human Rights Council in 2016, where he reported, I quote, that clampdowns on public freedoms and crackdowns on civil society activists and human rights defenders are hacking away at the forces which, are, which uphold the healthy functioning of societies. 30 obstructionist amendments to the text of the resolution on human rights defenders were proposed by a small group of states comprising Russia, China, Egypt, Cuba, Pakistan, and South Africa, all of which were defeated before the resolution as originally drafted was adopted by a majority of the members of the Human Rights Council. So it's a very sad day when South Africa is not 100% in support of human rights defenders, particularly those looking at economic and social rights. The resolution, while expressing concerns, also emphasizes the positive contribution of independent, diverse, and pluralistic civil society to peace, security, sustainable development, and human rights, and highlights reform to safeguard the ability of civil society actors to fully exercise the rights to freedom of expression, opinion, assembly, and association. These rights are entrenched in our Bill of Rights. South Africa should have been championing, championing them and committing to the protection of human rights defenders instead of joining the detractors. In March 2014, at the Universal Periodic Review on China by the Human Rights Council, China objected to a request from the NGO rep representatives, and their request was to be permitted to use a minute or so of their own speaking time to observe a minute of silence for a Chinese activist who had died in custody uh, and, and who had planned to come to the Human Rights Council. South Africa joined China in also opposing the request of the NGO, stating, I quote, that it was irregular and incompatible with the rules of procedure and that it would, I quote, create a dangerous precedent. So once again, Democratic South Africa used the same language as the apartheid regime had done in years prior in order to block freedom of speech. South Africa's votes on a raft of human rights resolutions are inconsistent and not necessarily in conformity with the ethos of our constitution. Uh, in September 2019, South Africa voted in favor of resolutions condemning violations of human rights in Yemen, and, and Myanmar, very good, but abstained on condemning violations in Venezuela, Burundi, and Syria. On the other hand, in a welcome move, it supported the right to development, the right to social security, and the abolition of the death penalty. So let me move now to international criminal justice. South Africa, as you know, is one of the founding members of the International Criminal Court. And throughout the process of negotiation and adoption of the Rome Statute, South Africa played a leading role. At the International Conference, Justice Minister Dalla Omar said on behalf of the Sardec states, I quote, the establishment of an international criminal court would not only strengthen the arsenal of measures to combat gross human rights violations, but would ultimately contribute to the attainment of international peace. In view of the crimes committed under the apartheid system, the International Criminal Court should send a clear message 
that the international community was resolved that the perpetrators of such gross human rights violations would not go unpunished. This good intent was put to shame by South Africa's decision not to arrest and surrender Omar al-Bashir, former president of Sudan, on a warrant issued by the ICC in June 2014. And that was when President uh, Omar al-Bashir was in our country. The decision was declared unlawful by the North Gauteng High Court of South Africa as well as the Supreme Court of Appeal on the premise that South Africa had acted in breach of its obligations under our National Implementation Act as well as the Rome Statute. In addition, hundreds of researchers, academics, civil society leaders and human rights advocates were dismayed that a country that had taken a leadership position on international criminal law now flouted its obligations to a court it had so eagerly helped to create. In response to widespread condemnation, South Africa attempted to withdraw from the ICC, giving as its reason, amongst others, that it considered that both the Implementation Act and the Rome Statute compelled the government to arrest persons who may enjoy diplomatic immunity under customary international law. It also claimed that its obligations to the ICC complicated conflict resolutions efforts. You will recall that the High Court ruled that the government must revoke that decision of withdrawal as it was made without the authority of Parliament. If South Africa wanted to withdraw, it would have to do so in a procedurally coherent and legal manner. At the African Union, declarations have been made indicating that sitting heads of state or government and other senior state officials are immune from prosecutions during their tenure of office. South Africa has not distanced itself from these declarations. And in protecting al-Bashir from prosecution by the ICC, South Africa has lent credence to the notion that senior po political officials should be immune from prosecution, even in instances where they are alleged to have perpetrated genocide. It is evident that this idea of immunity for political leaders arose because of the profile of the persons in indicted, and not because of the nature of the alleged crimes or the numbers of the victims. The notion that political power can be a safe haven for impunity would create an unacceptable double standard for accountability. It is also incompatible with international law and our constitution. Currently, South Africa has a bill before Parliament seeking an amendment to the Implementation Act to permit Im immunity from prosecution for heads of state and government and senior officials. The bill has not been acted upon as yet, but it is concerning that there has been no move to withdraw the bill. By enacting the Implementation Act, South Africa accepted responsibility for undertaking prosecution of heinous crimes. Now, fortunately, South African courts have delivered judgments that have placed the judiciary at the forefront of domestic implementation of international crimes and have thereby ensured that our country does not become a safe haven for suspected perpetrators of atrocity crimes. These cases also provide hope that justice will be carried out for victims of egregious crimes across the continent. I view the recent decision from the government of Sudan to allow Omar al-Bashir to stand trial before the ICC as proof that the arc of history is long and bends towards justice. South Africa should learn from its past blunders, recognize the futility of protecting alleged war criminals, and actively play a role in bending the arc of history in the direction of accountability. I do want to say something about the UN Arms Treaty that was adopted by the UN General Assembly on 2nd April 2013. South Africa played a leading role in pushing for the arms trade treaty, the ATT. It ratified it in December 2014 on the date it came into force. 
The ATT prohibits parties to the treaty from exporting weapons if they know at the time of authorization that these weapons will be used to commit war crimes, to be used against civilians, or violate the Geneva Conventions. The country adopted the National Conventions Arms Control Act and set up an oversight body, the National Convention Arms Control Committee, NCACC. The preamble of our national act says the purpose is to establish a legitimate, effective and transparent arms control system for the protection of all people's rights to life and security against repression. It adds that South Africa is, I quote, a responsible member of the international community and will not trade in conventional arms with states engaged in repression, aggression and terrorism. And further quote, it is vitally important to ensure accountability in all matters concerning conventional arms. In practice, the evidence points to failures on the part of the oversight body, the NCACC, to uphold this mandate. It is failing to fulfill the goal of ensuring a rules-based, human rights-oriented approach to the arms trade and is criticized for having neither the will nor the capacity to exercise proper oversight. Since the outbreak of civil war in Yemen and between the years 2015 and 2016, arms to the value of 7 billion rands were sold by South Africa to Saudi Arabia and UAE with no checks as to their end use in Yemen. The sales are made through the state-owned enterprises Rheinmetall Denel Munition, which I shall call Denel, and its joint venture with the German arms manufacturer Rheinmetall W Munition. The German company owns 51% of Denel. The German company is not able to sell the arms directly because German laws prohibit arms sales to Saudi Arabia and UAE. The Saudi-led coalition fighting in Yemen, as you know, is supported by the US and UK. The Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights on September 2015 released a, a report that attacks by coalition forces had targeted civilians including airstrikes on displaced females fleeing the fighting in Yemen. And it warned that the parties to the war had committed acts which amounted to war crimes, as well as abuses and violations of international human rights law. In 2016, massive aerial bombings of the port city of al Hadaida resulted in 60 civilian deaths, hundreds injured, and extensive damage to the infrastructure including water units, hospitals and roads. So they are still without water and, and hospitals and roads. A Security Council mandated panel of experts also investigated the attack in January 2019 and uncovered perhaps the most compelling evidence that Rheinmetall or Denel munitions were used in the massacre at al Hodaida. The panel found, I quote, the motor used for that attack had characteristics of those produced either by Rheinmetall in Germany or by its South African subsidiary Denel, which reportedly also produces motor shells in a factory in Saudi Arabia. The expert panel established that the 120 millimeter motor rounds used in the attacks on Odaida City were produced by a factory in al Khaj. South Saudi Arabia. That factory was run by Denel, and that factory was opened at an elaborate ceremony by former President Jacob Zuma and Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman bin Abdul Aziz of Saudi Arabia in March 2016. So although there are three, at least three investigative public reports, the OHCHR report to the Human Rights Council, the Security Council mandated expert panel report, and the report of the non-profit organization Open Secrets here in South Africa. So although all these were publicly available, the NCACC failed to take note of any of them and failed to take steps to investigate and stop the use of the arms 
that they had sold against civilians in Yemen in violation of our national law as well as the ATT. Now, South, Africans, South Africa's foreign policy positions on the armed state are inconsistent with their stated commitment. This incoherence has a significant negative impact on respect for human rights across the world. At Security Council debates on the conflict in Yemen, South Africa's Minister of Inter Inter International Relations and Cooperation, Naledi Pando, as well as our ambassadors, condemned the attacks on civilians in Yemen and expressed concern at the humanitarian crisis caused by the war in Yemen. So therefore, DERCO, that's the Department of International Relations and Cooperation, is thus aware of the devastation caused by the war in Yemen and, and itself purports to seek its resolution. It must account for why, if that is true, it has yet to use its role within NCACC to discourage the export of South African weapons that may fuel the conflict in Yemen. So finally, let me conclude by saying that while South Africa has often played an important role in a number of pressing human rights issues, the record makes clear that its engagement with international human rights law is a cause for concern. Whatever group or regional loyalty South Africa supports, these not, must not be at the expense of adherence to its stated commitments to constitutional principles and values and promises of their implementation. When South Africa adopted its constitution in 1996, it committed to making human rights an incontrovertible and unimpeachable part of its law and its politics. The world may have changed since then, but that commitment is needed now more than ever. Thank you very much. Sorry I took extra time. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very thank much, much. Um, Judge Pele. Thank you, Jeremy. Great. Um, Judge Pele, so we have had, while you were speaking, um, quite a few questions in the chat. I'm going to try and summarise a few of them and um, also to perhaps now that we have a little bit of time, see if anyone also wants to pose some live questions. But um, I apologise if I don't get to all the chat questions, but I'll just um, pose a few because obviously it's been difficult for you to follow the chat questions. So for Mr. Reddy, we have a question about the reason for the Security Council not being able to refer the North Korean government to the International Criminal Court, and also what is the relationship between South Africa and North Korea vis-a-vis -vis human rights. Um, I'll, shall I pose them all and you can take a note of them, or would you prefer to answer as I pose them? I think your um, mic is off, Judge Pillay. Your side muted me. All right, so just briefly, can you touch that on that question again? North Korea and South Korea and the relations? And no, it's the reason for the Security Council not being able to refer the North Korean government to the International Criminal Court and what ah. is South Africa's relationship um, with North Korea vis-a-vis -vis human rights. Well, what would you prefer? I address them now? Um, I'm in your hands. Um, let me just go through them and then you can see um, what you would prefer to respond to um, as we go. 
Um, there's another question related to what do you think legal practitioners can do to facilitate progress on human rights both at national and international levels? Also on the Yogata principles um, and the Green Paper on marriage, um, some amendments there. Um, relating to LGBTQI and your views on the clashes between culture and human rights, particularly in the context of LGBTIQ rights. And then a question um, about accountability mechanisms for South African representatives when they make decisions at an international mm. level that do not, um, you know, comply with our constitution. Um, and a question, another question about um, uh, regarding the issue of UN country teams and their role in promoting human rights across the mandible mandate of human rights and also the role of chapter nine institutions like the Human Rights Commission. So that I'm going to leave it at that for now. I'm going to, uh, Prof Madonsela also has a question, but I'm going to see if I can get her to pose it in, in person. But perhaps I can just leave you with those few to get going and then I can pose some more. Thank you. Well, thank you very much everyone, everyone for those questions. Um, the, the key reason why uh, Security Council has not referred North Korea to the International Criminal Court is this paralysis. This is why I spent so much time in my lecture to say what is happening at the macro level. If the one supreme body in charge of international peace and security cannot get their act together, they so divide it. So, so we say there's almost a breakdown there one or the other of the veto-wielding states. So China, for instance, would clearly veto any referral of North Korea to the ICC. Uh, and so I, I invite you to support the movement from all over, including from very, very many states, to urge the Security Council to adopt a practice where they do not use the veto when the evidence before them uh, adds to uh, the commission of uh, atrocities and violations of international humanitarian law. We can at least start from there because the P5 have refused to give, up, to give up this right of a veto that they have. So with South Africa and North Korea, uh, I think it's all we have is NGO activity and interest in South Africa. Um, South Africa has not supported any resolutions that are critical of North Korea. Um, and I think that, you know, th this is so wrong because we are not reaching out to help a very helpless population in that country that has cut itself off from the rest of the world. What can legal practitioners do uh, at, at the national in, and international level? Um, spread awareness. I mean, for instance, did you know of all these decisions taken on, on human rights resolutions that are happening outside. Do you know that there's a bill sitting in Parliament just to provide immunity from prosecution for these serious crimes for heads of states and for politicians? So awareness and your suggestions on how we could stop them. So while it's being done in the dark, we need to flesh out and make them transparent. I can't tell you the number of times people have come up to me and said that decision delivered by your South African court has helped us here. For instance, in, um, in Malaysia, our decision on the, on the, uh, uh, the uh, giving permission for the production of generic medicines for HIV AIDS, they thanked me for that. Thank God for your court's decision. Now we lawyers can bring this case in uh, Malaysia. So many, many instances like that. Uh, right now, I know that uh, the Supreme Court of, Ch of uh, South Korea is looking at uh, the issue before it on the death penalty, 
whether they should abolish or not. And uh, a brief, an amicus brief, produces for them almost intact the decision of our constitutional court. So courts obviously can't jump in and do this if lawyers don't bring the cases before them and if if uh, non-profit organizations don't inve investigate and come up with evidence. So there's so much we can do. Now on LGBTI rights, uh, this is why I was appalled that South Africa voted against having an oversight mechanism that will monitor violations of the rights of the LGBTI community. With regard to the clash of culture and human rights, I think you know every aspect of culture and religion uh, has the undertone and underscores human rights protection. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights and our Constitution does not say you protect everybody's rights except the LGBTI community. Uh, so fortunately that culture of protection is embedded in our constitutions, but in many, many parts of the world, the individuals suffer discrimination and even death sentences. So I think the next question really is highlighting what can we do when our representatives take up positions in international fora that do not accord with our constitutions. Um, so I think we should be alert to this and, and, and start discussions and debates. Media should also be very alert to what is being said out. Now all these statements are public statements made in the Security Council and UN fora. But what we get is just the rhetoric, uh, statements of commitment, and we're not hearing exactly how they block things out of loyalty to their friends, the alliances that they have formed. I've always said that states must hold their friends to the same standards as they hold their foes. Now, how can, uh, and you asked about UN country teams, to promote human rights and chapter nine institutions. We have the best institutions flowing from our constitution, that's the chapter nine institutions. Well, they're not doing very well, not all of them. I would say that they must be properly funded because they are our eyes and ears. They are mechanisms to which the public can bring their complaints and have that resolved. If these institutions in our countries work well, we don't have to bring these complaints to the international fora. Thank you, Sandra. Thanks very much. Um, so um, I'm going to, there are a few hands that have gone up. Um, we also have, uh, so I'm going to call upon, if she's willing, uh, Prof. Madon Sela to pose her important question, which is also linked to a question by Mr. Frolic regarding the Israel-Palestine conflict and the proposals to um, downgrade um, the embassy in South Africa, in Israel, to a liaison office and for South Africa to expel the Israeli ambassador to South Africa and impose sanctions. Um, so there's an interest in your views on that, but I'm going to ask, call on Prof. Madonsela to pose her question, and then I'm going to ask Mr. Gaum to pose his question from the South African Human Rights Commission. So, Prof. Cooley? Thank, thank you, Prof. Sandy. You did catch me by surprise, and uh, but it is a privilege to do this. Firstly, Judge Pillay, thank you for such an insightful, far uh, and very frank lecture on South Africa's international human rights record. We really appreciate it, and we also appreciate you for discharging your responsibilities with passion, compassion, and, and justice when you were posted in these international forums. My question is about this, what Prof. Sandy has already said, 
It's about the very difficult issue of Palestine. At some stage, as ANC, we were in exactly the same position as PLO and uh, the um, Polisario in Western Sahara or Morocco. And at some stage, we all hoped that uh, there will be self-determination, there will be equal enjoyment of all rights and freedoms. In South Africa today, at least we can claim that we have formal equality and we have the opportunity to advance substantive equality because we now have political freedom. Palestinians don't have the same. The Saurari people in uh, Western Sahara don't have the same period, freedom. What should, what should be South Africa's moral voice and as an international law actor in, in these particular circumstances? Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Sandy. Thanks very Thank you. much. Thanks, thanks. Um, do you want to answer that, Navi? Um, because that's that's a big issue and linked to Palestine, and then we'll come back to some of the other questions. Yes, I'll do that, Sandy. Yeah. Um, you know, for six years as High Commissioner for Human Rights, um, so you can hear me, right? Yes. Um, yes. Yes. So I, I lived with this and I've been twice to Palestine, first time at the invitation of the Israeli government actually. Uh, so I have great sympathy for civilians uh, both in Israel and in Palestine who are suffering from uh, these attacks. I'm, I'm talking about innocent civilians. Um, but before my time, before the Human Rights Council, there was the Human Rights Commission, the old Human Rights Commission. And so when the Human Rights Council was created, they took over the work of the Commission. And the Commission had two uh, agenda items they fixed. One was on apartheid South Africa and the other Palestine. So of course when apartheid ended, the Human Rights Council has this issue of, the, of occupied Palestinian territories. And that's known as agenda item four a regular agenda item for the Human Rights Council. And the High Commissioner and her staff have to prepare almost 12 reports a year on the, on the many, many attacks and violations where children are stoned or where the olive trees are, are, are being are chopped down by settlers, um, you know, prohibition from entering the mosque, you name them, and the attacks on, on Gaza and, and West Bank and so on. So all this is dealt with in reports, in reports, extremely valuable information. But do you know, know what? The Western states, including the whole of Europe, has decided not to attend any sessions of Agenda Item 4. So it's left to developing countries where South Africa plays a key role. So. So I'm indicating to you by that, you see how divisive it is outside there. Uh, and, and the main factor is the United States saying they have a special relationship with, um, with Israel, which means they will always support it. I read some figures about um, the amount of money that the U.S. gives for military weapons to Israel. Um, U.S.-Israel partnership from 2019 to 2028, the U.S. pledged to provide $38 billion in military aid to Israel. So, so, so unequal that it's no wonder that the U.S. is not trusted as an impartial negotiator for peace. So all the other countries should, be, should do much more. And I also want to say to you the reality is that the Arab states the Middle Eastern countries are not together on this. They're also very divided because they're dependent on the U.S. for, for many favors, both trade and military weapons. So, Tuli, thank you so much for your kind remarks and, and raising this difficult issue. People come up with all kinds of strategies. So it's not my strategy if somebody's asking us not to host the Israeli embassy in South Africa. I mean, this is what the world did to apartheid South Africa, is they, they kicked us out. 
so we were forced to change. I hope it works, but it's somebody's strategy. Uh, I have not called for that because I believe in dialogue, negotiation, and so on. Um, I think South Africa can raise its moral voice and be very consistent in its support of, of Palestine. Uh, th there's really room for improvement there on, on how we could help Palestine more because of all the people, we who experience apartheid know what it's like to be without land. Each time I went there to Palestine, I've been to East Jerusalem, it's terrible loss that you can own your property to the third generation. I met a f one family where he has no more children. So when he dies, his property is taken over for, for Jewish uh, settlers. I went there just two years ago, or less than two years ago, to al Qads University uh, in Palestine and met with all the students and really understood how difficult, how traumatized they are to have to study under those uh, terrible conditions. They're all preoccupied with how, who's, who's going to help us do this. And let me say, they don't even have much faith in their own Palestinian government representatives to do much for them. The vice chancellor of al Qaeda University told me that he used to just do a four minutes ride to go to his university. And now this great big wall has been built right across their campus and so on. And he has to now go and drive right down, keeping only to roads meant for Palestinian use only. And it takes him about 30 minutes, whereas previously it took four minutes. So when you hear the reality of what it's like for ordinary people, it, it is, I think, uh, inhuman. And we, we really should look for strategies on how to help them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judge Pele. I'm going to give the floor now to Advocate Gaum of the South African Human Rights Commission. Advocate Gaum, you have the floor, please. Thanks, Pro Professor Smith. Uh, Smith. Um, yes, I think it is a great honor for me to be in the um, presence of Judge Pele as well as uh, the chair of the South African Human Rights Commission, uh, Advocate Ghani Majola, as well as uh, in the presence of our former public protector, as well as I see Judge um, former Judge Goldstone has also joined us, and that is a great privilege. But. Um, Yes, so you have pointed out, uh, Judge Pele, uh, various uh, uh, issues pertaining to the South African government where they haven't act, acted, you know, uh, correctly in a sense in terms of human rights issues. And maybe the question then is how are we going to um, ensure or what should we recommend from the side of the Human Rights Commission? that they do in fact correct those issues. So that is in essence my question. Um, I agree with you that, uh, you know, one can't have a Bill of Rights that is um, pursuing certain matters, including LGBTI issues and so on. And then on another level you are actually um, you know, not uh, attempting to force that down as matters of uh, immediate importance that should be enforced by the government. So how uh, do you recommend inter alia also to the Human Rights Commission to do uh, that and to make sure that those issues are actually enforced? Well, thank you very much for your question, Advocate Garm. And, uh, and on the subject, let me say I truly admire Bongani Majola and all the commissioners who sit on this commission. I know that you are, you are really overworked. That's why I put in a plug for, for proper funding for you. So, Advocate Garm, I think I'm right that the Human Rights Council's mandate 
doesn't limit it just to look at complaints that are made to it. You can, proprio moto, raise issues yourself and look at it. And one of them could, it could be the um, positions that are adopted outside. For instance, not protecting human rights defenders who are working on um, economic and social rights. That is very much under your mandate of human rights defenders, civil society space, and, and while on the subject, let me say that the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights has also found that um, South Africa ha has uh, neglected to protect, yes, yeah, South Africa's uh, failure to address economic, social and cultural rights. So that's the finding. The concluding ob observation of the UN Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. That was in 29 November 2018. The committee is concerned that reports of human rights defenders, particularly those working to promote and defend the rights under the covenant in the mining and environmental sectors being threatened and harassed. It is also concerned that the overly broad and vague definition of public violence which may have a deterrent effect on participation, participants in peaceful protests. So, these are public comments. When you hear of this, is it possible for the Human Rights Commission to take these up? You know, um, it's not that you are following everything and you will know everything, but these are very important findings made by your fellow organization, which is the committee on... Um, economic and social rights. And actually, just two days ago, May 17th, uh, there was a decision, uh, CEDAW, the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, they issued their public statement uh, on South Africa's low levels of prosecution and conviction in domestic violence cases and their frequent failures by the police to serve and enforce protection orders. They said that out of 143,824 requests for protection orders in 2018-2019, only 22,211 were granted. And in many of these cases, the public order just instructed the abuser to sleep in another room in the same house. So I, I just found this as I was preparing this lecture. So if things like that come to your notice, you will be doing the public a huge favor. You will be doing the discriminated activists, the community, the women who are be being beaten up by taking these issues much further and asking for explanations from our government, not only explanations, what's their plan of action to remedy these findings. So I hope I've answered your question, Advocate Gom. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. You did indeed. Thank Thanks, you. George. Thanks. Um, I'm going to just pose one more question to you from Ms. Bates um, on the chat, uh, Navi. Um, she yeah. is basically asking on, do you think that the, what is your assessment of the health of the South African judiciary today? And um, what are the qualities that you would like to see in South Africa's new Chief Justice who will be appointed later this year? You know, we have many mechanisms in place to safeguard the independence and to ensure levels of competence, impartiality, integrity, um, the, and, and the lack of uh, distancing from political parties and ships. So we've got all the mechanisms. People admire us for having the Judicial Service Commission. We have to ensure that it's not overtaken by politicians uh, who have a different agenda. They don't want judges who will rule against them. And we saw this in the most powerful the country that claims itself as the most democratic country in the world, and that is the United States. And you can see how much 
attention was paid by the politicians in the selection of their judges. So there are bad examples out there that we should move away from. We have good institutions. We have codes of ethics which tell you the qualifications and competence of judges. That must be strictly adhered to. Now, either judges regulate their own affairs and have their own disciplinary mechanisms, or they will be leaving it to the states to do that, which is not a welcome step. They should be able to control their own affairs and deal with their members who are underperforming or who are not complying with the ethos of, of the judiciary. So there are many, many qualifications. You know, I've been through this because I was in two international tribunals, both in Rwanda and the International Criminal Court, and we went through a vigorous public interviews to achieve those positions. Uh, and once we get there, we have to be, we have to deliver. We have to deliver justice as the public expects you to do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judge Pele. I think it's been a long day, and particularly for you, I know you also had sessions of the International Court of Justice today in the matter concerning Myanmar that I mentioned. Um, we've had a very, very rich session, and so it falls to me to thank you most sincerely Judge Pele Navi for your very principled, no barb, uh, no holds barred, but also balanced assessment of the good, the bad and the ugly of South Africa's international engagement with human rights. This was an incredibly well researched an informative lecture and I think it has been really perfect for our 15th annual human rights lecture. Um, I then want to move on to do a few other thank yous. Um, secondly, I want to thank um, Christo Els from Weber Wenzel for his beautiful scene setting remarks and for the whole team at Weber Wenzel for being with us from the start of this annual human rights lecture series, for the support they provide, um, including this year where for the first time, as Nicola Smith mentioned, we have moved online um, due to the circumstances. So we greatly value this partnership. Then I want to thank um, the Dean of our Law Faculty, Professor Smith, for her unstinting support and camaraderie, should I say, for this lecture and through all the challenges that we have faced in trying to organize it, um, including the fear of load shedding and various other dramas behind the scenes. To her amazing um, Executive Secretary, Yolandi um, Philander, for her administrative support for this event behind the scenes. Thank you, Yolandi. And then for Ms. Alma Kurtzen, who did all the technical support for this event. It was very challenging to figure out on the platforms and the registrations and, you know, many issues behind the scene. Thank you very much, Alma, for your calm, kind and supportive professional organization of the event. It's greatly appreciated. And then to Christian van Skalkweg, um, my LLD candidate and also assisting the work of my chair, thank you for all your support, help, suggestions and everything you've done to contribute to this event. Last but not least, I would like to thank all of you participants for being um, participating in the event, for your active engagement, your excellent questions in the chat, um, and also for bearing with, with us with some of the technical hiccups we had at the, at the start. 
Um, we will be, as um, Prof um, Smith mentioned, we have recorded the lecture. It will be posted to the YouTube um, version of the Law Faculty. In addition, uh, we have a copy of Judge Pillay's address, which we will be also posting to the website of the faculty and the university. So once more, thank you to all of you, um, and I hope you all have a lovely evening further. I hope you can rest, Navi, and have a, a relaxing evening. You've been absolutely brilliant, and we're very grateful for your insights tonight. Thank Thanks, you very Andy. much.